MIB, thank you so much for coming to YouTube headquarters. Yeah, sure. Uh, thanks for flying me out here. We here at YouTube have been watching your channel really closely. We love the whole lonely guy, not sure if he's quite crazy shtick you've been doing. Ah, oh, it's good stuff. Good stuff. But that's not a shtick. But at the end of the day, your channel needs more clicks. So, we want you to try some new things to increase your viewership. Uh, okay, sure, yeah. As long as I get to stay true to the spirit of the channel. More sensationalism. Uh, easy to digest top five list. Hire a sexy co-host that'll make the thumbnails mm, really enticing, if you know what I mean. Uh, an animated intro. Uh, oh, what if you say a catchphrase at the end of every video? A catchphrase? I don't need a catchphrase. Wait, why can't I curse? Uh, yeah, that's the other thing. Turns out your demographic skews kind of young. So we're gonna have to ask you to tone down the language. Get those clicks, MIB. Otherwise, you could take your nonsense over to Daily Motion where nobody will ever see your videos. But I can't do all this stuff. I'm just one guy doing this channel out of my basement. Oh, and if you get over 100,000 subscribers, YouTube will send you a nice plaque. A plaque? Well, why didn't you say so? This video is sponsored by Crazy Netty Adult Sex Dolls, where every doll is pre-tested by Crazy Netty. That's the Crazy Netty guarantee. Welcome to MIB's Top 5. Yay. Today we're counting down the five biggest WTF moments in the history of the Godzilla franchise. And it's important you know that every moment in this countdown is officially approved by Toho, the owners of Godzilla. We all know Godzilla has had a sketchy history. There was that time he slid on his tail to attack Megalon. One time he used his atomic breath to actually fly. Hell, he's even played basketball against Charles Barkley. But today, we're digging a lot deeper. We're covering stuff that even the biggest fans may not know. Oh, but before we get started, I need to introduce my brand new Countdown co-host. Take it away! Are you waiting on me? I'm sorry, I'm so- I'm really confused right now. I'm just- I'm just here because this said free weed. It said to- it just said to wear a tank top that said clickbait. So, I'm just- I'm just here to claim the free weed. Yeah, so what you're gonna do is help me count down. So, I'm not gonna get free weed? Oh, there's a typo on that flyer. It was supposed to say no free weed. I mean, that's kind of a letdown. You can't- this is false advertising. Honestly, you can't just say free weed and then expect for me to show up and not demand free weed. Fine, help me with the video and I'll get you your weed somehow. All right, everyone, hello, and welcome to the Top 5 Show with me, Clickbait, and your friend, MIB. Are you ready for the countdown? F**k, you're really good at this. Number 5. Monster Warrior Godzilla. So in 1990, a Godzilla anthology comic book was released in Japan. It was simply known as The Godzilla Comic. Not to be confused with The Godzilla Movie. The anthology featured 15 original stories by different artists and writers who offered some different takes on Godzilla. Which brings us to our number 5 entry, a story in the anthology called Monster Warrior Godzilla, where Godzilla and his friends are anthropomorphic barbarians. It starts with the monster warriors requesting Godzilla's help in the ongoing war against humans. After a vicious attack against his friends, Godzilla declares war. The fight is taken into outer space, and yeah, that's definitely Godzilla slicing a spaceship with a sword while shooting lasers from his back armor. And if that's not rock and roll, I don't know what is. He saves a wood nymph, so we get this interesting picture. Then he faces this army of mechas, including a souped up jet jaguar on a motorcycle. I mean, this story has great artwork, and it's a fun take on these characters. But as crazy as it is, it's not as crazy as... Number 4 Godzilla fought Gamera 
Gamera is a popular Japanese franchise, uh, separate from Godzilla, that kicked off in 1965 and continued through the decades. But the reason you never see Gamera challenging Godzilla is because they're owned by two different studios. Godzilla comes to us from Toho while Gamera comes from Daie, now known as Katakawa Daie. It's sort of like Freddy and Jason, or Mickey Mouse and Bugs Bunny, different studios. So, of course, for decades, fans have wanted to see these two properties collide. Like when Freddy fought Jason, or when Mickey Mouse met Bugs Bunny. Well, according to the website Sci-Fi Japan, in 2002, Gamera's studio approached Toho about a Godzilla vs. Gamera movie, but Toho rejected the offer. And that was that! Which is funny, because Godzilla and Gamera did meet with the approval of both studios before. And it was over 30 years earlier. It turns out that in 1970, Toho and Daie co-founded a stage show during the Children's Festival in the Osaka World's Fair. The show took place at the Expo's Festival Plaza, and it featured characters from both franchises. This one-act show was performed every night for 10 days. Godzilla and Gamera shared a stage, and it was 100% official! And unfortunately, no video has surfaced from this meetup. The greatest monster confrontation of all time. And right now, it's just lost. Number 3. A Tiny Godzilla. I want to touch on another story in that same 1990 manga, and this one's called A Tiny Godzilla. In this one, a cameraman for Oz publication named John Kawasaki is sent on an assignment. He meets a mysterious woman and offers to show her around. She agrees, and eventually... <laughs> Meanwhile, Godzilla arises from the Arctic and begins making his way toward Japan. So long story short, it turns out the mysterious woman is an alien, and she kidnaps Kawasaki and forces him to continuously have sex with her. She explains that Godzilla is a vengeful spirit, and also that she's from planet Q-78, nice little nod to Ultraman, whose environment collapsed. These aliens came to Earth to get slaves. They purposely selected Japanese specimens who were healthy but lacked intellect. Shots fired! She sends Kawasaki back to Tokyo with a box, his editor-in-chief sneaks a look inside the box, and he's transformed into a tiny Godzilla. I, I, I don't know. Hold me close, a tiny Godzilla. Number two. Godzilla versus King Godzilla. From 1992 to 1993, a Godzilla manga series was serialized in the pages of DX Bomb Bomb magazine. The chapters of the serial were then collected to make two volumes of this manga titled Godzilla King of the Monsters. The art is really good, except when it's not. Who drew Godzilla here, Rob Liefeld? Most of the plot has a mad scientist named Dr. Aniyama genetically altering monsters to face Godzilla. The fights are brutal as hell, but at the end, things get weird. Dr. Oniyama creates a monster called King Godzilla. He's got the body and head of Godzilla, King Ghidorah's legs, King Ghidorah's heads as his arms, and Batra's wings. Oh, and Biollante's head is able to burst out of his chest. And the real Godzilla has to fight this abomination. It's crazy. And Godzilla only managed to win by holding King Godzilla and throwing them both into a volcano. Yeah, that's how the whole series ends. I guess one cool thing about King Godzilla is if you get creative, you can make your own action figure of him. But none of the entries on this list can compete with the number one spot. Number one. A Space Godzilla. In the late 1970s, a story called A Space Godzilla was written with the hopes that it would become the 16th Godzilla movie. Toho rejected the plot, but then for some insane reason, approved that it be turned into a two-part story published in the Japanese edition of Starlog magazine. Part one is called Farewell Earth. Godzilla's dead carcass washes up on the beach one day. How do you like that? The main character is already dead. So what happened? Did the army take him out? Was it another giant monster? No, it was diabetes. Diabetes killed Godzilla. The diabetes. They remove Godzilla's brain to discover it's still kind of alive, and then in his body, they find a baby. We find out that Godzilla's name isn't actually Godzilla. It's Roseanne. Like Rodan, but with a Z. Not Roseanne. Roseanne. 
Oh, whatever. Roseanne comes from planet Godzilla and must return home where her husband is waiting. Has this writer ever even seen a Godzilla movie? Roseanne launches like a rocket, complete with detaching her body from below the waist and stomach. Yeah, somewhere in outer space, Godzilla's ass is just floating around. Part 2 is called Return to the Planet. Roseanne travels through a vortex back home while her body parts grow back. The baby, which is stuck in a womb dangling outside her body, mind you, is named Reerin. Meanwhile, Planet Godzilla has been invaded by a race of people that have human bodies but goat legs. Oh, and when their general becomes angry, flames would come out of her enormous breasts, and throwing knives the shape of swastikas come flying out of her belly button. At this point, it just sounds like Apple Autofill wrote this story. Anyway, Roseanne is killed by the evil general, and her husband, Kunin, makes a speech to the other Godzillas, convincing them to fight. Because we all know that a Godzilla needs to be convinced to fight. An army of Godzillas then storm the castle walls like in Lord of the Rings. And Kunin bites off the general's head and tosses it into a sea of sulfuric acid. Are you still here? Did I lose you? Look, the thing about the late 1970s was there was this movie everybody loved you might have heard of called The Star Wars. And so everyone wanted to write a space opera. But this, this is like watching 2001 A Space Odyssey backwards while spinning around in one of those high velocity things that astronauts train in. I'm MIB, and that was by far the most WTF moment in Godzilla's history. What does MIB stand for anyway? MIB. Well, obviously, men in black. Um, and then we've got massively itchy butt. Is your butt massively itchy? Uh, hmm, MIB. Uh, mustache inside. I keep going back to butt. You must be a butt man. So, like I said, all you have to do for this job is say, like, number five and number four. Mr. Azalea Banks. That sounds like someone I know. That, that would be a copycat. Mrs. Are you secretly a Mrs.? Mrs. Mrs. Inside. We know where I want to go with a B again, don't we? <laughs> <sighs> I've made a terrible mistake. Maybe it's black. It's Monster Island Buddies. Monster Island Buddies? Really? Monster Island Buddies. That doesn't even mean anything. It's the name of this YouTube channel. Uh, just wrap this up for me, will you? Thank you so much for having me. Once again, I'm Clickbait. I can't wait for next time. Back to you, MIB. Can I smoke my weed yet? My, I... I'm done, right? Goodbye. Thanks for watching, guys. Don't forget to support the channel by liking, sharing, and subscribing. Right? Those are three things. Liking, sharing, and subscribing. Is that right? Did I do this right? You're just letting this roll on because it's funny. Did I do that right, though? Is that right? Okay. This video is sponsored by... Luxury towels for cats. <coughs> Wet paws? You gotta be kidding me. <coughs> now you can pamper your cat with style. Order your luxury towel right now. Greetings, MIB here! As you know, the folk at YouTube are forcing me to make these countdown videos to get more viewers. So what should we talk about today? Let's pick from the bowl. Man, I really gotta update this bowl. Okay, arcade games. This could be fun. Yeah, millennials. In my day, we had to go to an arcade to play the best video games. And we had to pay a shiny quarter or two. And when you died, you had to pay again. I really miss those days as it was such a great social experience. Plus, it was always exciting to head to the arcade and see what hot new games were out. Some of them really pushed the boundaries of innovation. But other games, well, other games were just really bizarre. There was no internet or anything to explain what the hell we were looking at. Today, I want to reflect on five such games. Oh, but first, let's throw it over to my countdown co-host, Clickbait. How are you, Clickbait?
Actually, I'm really excited to be here today because I have an audition for American Idol right after this. In fact, I'm going to give you a little sneak preview of what I'm going to do at my audition. So you're the lucky ones today. Uh, I didn't do my warm ups properly. Hold on one second. No, no, it's all right. You, you don't have to show us. Ha, 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 ha. Wow, that's, um, that's pretty good. I'm so excited. I think I'm going to nail it. <laughs> All right, so let's start counting down five bizarre arcade games, and we're going to stick to video games for this one. Clickbait, start us off. Number five. Jurassic Park. Do you remember the first time you saw Jurassic Park? The joy and wonder that came when Grant saw his first living dinosaur? The miracle of watching a raptor be born? Or how about the part where Dr. Sattler drove the jeep like a maniac while Grant held a machine gun and mowed down every dinosaur on the island? Yeah! In the Jurassic Park arcade game, death finds a way. This entire game is a fast-paced chaotic shooting gallery where every dino winds up dead, 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 dead. Sure, you need to defend yourself from the T-Rex. Wait, the visual here is implying that I'm behind glass. How am I shooting at him then? Anyway, sure. You need to defend yourself from the T-Rex, but what about those pesky plant eaters? F***ing vegetarians. In the movie, they were fed plants, but here, they're fed bullets. Pteranodon, Pteranagon! Triceratops, try going to hell. This game is so f***ing bonkers. You drive up a Baranosaurus's tail and over his head. There's no breaks between the levels. You can't catch your breath. You gotta kill them all and let God sort them out. But my favorite part is the ending. After 20 straight minutes of just shooting every dinosaur in madcap mayhem... Aw, oh, it's okay, T-Rex. You did alright. Now get all these dead dinosaurs out of here! So we can use this land to open up a hot topic. Listen, I know that technically you're not shooting the dinosaurs, but tranquilizing them, but then all my jokes won't work, so shut up. Number four. Diet Go Go. This 1992 game comes from Data East. Dr. Wiley Terminator here wants to make the world morbidly obese, so you gotta stuff his plan in his face. It's a bit of a bubble bobble type game where you fatten up your enemies by throwing. What is that, apples? How do apples make you fat? Well, I guess we should all avoid apples going forward. Oh. Oh. The enemies blow it up like me after a large meal, then bounce around when you hit them. But watch out, the baddies throw treats at you and they fatten you up back. Too many treats and you die. Of diabetes. This game puts the die in diet. Look at all that delicious stuff on screen. Ice cream, cakes, gingerbread men. This game is making me crave sugar! Let's diet! He starts every level yelling, let's diet. But then he fattens everyone up! That's the exact opposite of dieting! Let's diet! This game is fun, but its theme is so bizarre! And I'm not sure the world is ready for mascots who look like every single thing they post on Instagram is about how fit their lifestyle is. Alright, we get it! You love fitness! Number three! Oh wow, that one was a lot shorter than Number the Number three! Ah! Holy Rula! This 1991 beat em up from Tayato is a combination of LSD inspired visuals and hilariously bad English translations. An old man was impressed with a sense of danger and he called Zack and Mel. So this is Radish Land. Time moves only if this poor guy keeps turning a key. But when the key is stolen, time stops. So you have to use your magic wands to fight bad guys and. What the f? No! No! Sorry, I wasn't really prepared for that. Oh, so yeah, as you can see, this game looks really nice. Aesthetically, it's sort of a combination of Little Nemo and Yellow Submarine. You'll get the Kermit the Frog spump. 
is a little boy picking his nose. Tornado and ass. Hey, I said ass and it didn't get bleeped. Look at how this kid walks. Like he's not walking into a f***ing nightmare. What is that background? Here's a voodoo guy who wants to thrust his rhino crotch into you. Because Japan. Oh my god, I forgot to explain. So when you beat one of these bad guys, they turn into a cute little animal. It's like Sonic the Hedgehog, if by that you mean Sonic can summon a superhero to come out of a microwave and kill everyone. This is the main boss, and he's gonna replace my high school gym teacher in my reoccurring nightmares. So it turns out the Keymaster was possessed by an evil spirit because he lost patience with his monotonous life. I mean, yeah, that's sort of bound to happen. Someone give this guy an iPad so we don't have to do all this over again. One last thing, in the original version of the game, giant lady legs come out of the doors here. That was removed in the North American version, but when you beat the game, there's a slideshow of scenes, and a shot with the legs was not removed from that slideshow! Now that's funny. Do it, clickbait. Number two! Wall Street. No relation to the classic movie that came out five years later, this 1982 game from Century Electronics is only two unique stages. In stage one, you play firemen. See, these stockbrokers are jumping off the building like a bunch of lemmings in an attempt to commit suicide. Your job is to bounce them into the ambulance. If just one hits the pavement, you lose. Where do I start? First of all, this game is kind of hard. The physics are all wacky, and you have to bounce them into the ambulance. You can't overshoot them. Although, thankfully, if they bounce off screen, it doesn't count as a miss. Oh, and also, let's talk about how everyone in this game is trying to commit suicide. Yeah, these guys don't even want to be in this crappy video game. In stage two, you're a broker who runs around collecting money while shooting at tanks. So maybe I shouldn't have saved these guys. And also, this game should have been called Fall Street. What a missed opportunity. What can possibly be more bizarre? Number one. Chiller. Chiller is a 1986. Number. Oh. Sorry, I, th I thought you were done. Okay. Are you you're still going. Good? Okay. Chiller. Chiller is a 1986 shooting gallery game published by Exidy. Yeah, you shoot at people while they're being tortured. Oh, and guess what? It didn't do so hot in America because most arcade owners refused to buy it. Can you blame them? I mean, look at this game. The console has one gun, although it can go to two players in a trade-off mode. And as you can see, the more flesh you shoot off, the more points you can rack up. You gotta shoot really fast, but the gun doesn't lend well to rapid fire. The trigger actually hurt my finger after a while. Look at this game, I heard that if you beat it, men in black burst into the arcade and put you in a straitjacket, then drag you to a padded room somewhere. Aw oh man, you even shoot the dog? That's where I draw the line. Is that a rat humping a corpse? Is it a good idea that I'm murdering so many people in a room where ghosts are a thing? Level 2 is even crazier. You got this poor woman here slowly being devoured by a crocodile. Bunch of guys on these medieval traps. I bet the developer of this game was a real hit with the ladies. By the time you get to level 3, things are less tortury and more monstery. Here's the crazy part. Of all the games in this list, this was the only one that was ported to a home console! The Nintendo Entertainment System! Now granted, it was an unlicensed port, and they made some changes to focus more on shooting evil monsters instead of your co-workers. Apparently, the Chiller Arcade game was successful in third world countries. And look, I'm not saying I don't enjoy me some violent video games, but there's something so often bizarre about the level of gratuitousness in Chiller. I guess they had to make up for the fact that the game itself is pretty dull, not super fun to play. You can find any of these games on MAME and try them for yourself, although if you download Chiller, I can't promise that Homeland Security isn't being notified. The cabinet for Chiller is pretty rare to come across in arcades today, but you can find one in the Galloping Ghost Arcade in Chicago. Tell me if there are any other crazy arcade games I should mention in the comments below, or hey, share your general experiences going to the arcade.
It's definitely a part of video game culture that I sincerely miss. And thank you for returning once again, Clickbait. <coughs> What? Now I can't go to my audition. Speak up, Clickbait. I don't know if you heard, but I was gonna be the next American Idol. Ah! You doing an ASMR thing? I can't even sing anymore. I was gonna be the next American Idol. Now I can't even go to my audition because you made me host this thing. Oh, your voice is gone. Oh no, I feel so bad. Let's check in with my contact back at YouTube, Guy McMisterman. M.I.B. Oh, <laughs> YouTube revenue is going up. <laughs> Maybe someday you'll get some of this. You know what I'm saying? Get the clicks. We need the clicks. Woo! It's getting hot in here. It's getting hot here, M.I.B. <laughs> Wait, but Mr. McMisterman, when am I going to see some of that money? Get the plaque, M.I.B. It's all about that freaking plaque. Well, I mean, it's a little bit about some money. <laughs> yeah! Clickbait, how you feeling? I feel so bad. Goodbye. Did you hear what you did to me? Unbelievable. You want to say f kill you? F hate you. F bitch. You're a little bitch. And a f piece of Now f store. This video is sponsored by Area 52. On your next trip to Nevada, come visit Area 52. We don't have aliens or spaceships, but our apple pie is out of this world. Hey there, this is MIB and welcome to MIB's Top 5. As always, I am joined by my co-host, Clickbait. Hey guys, thanks so much for joining us for the new countdown. Once again, I'm Clickbait, and thank you, Wait. MIB. Wait! <laughs> Clickbait, why are there two of you? I just like looked up this thing called cloning, and it was like pretty easy. I just Googled like how to clone myself, because I, I figured, you know, I love being lazy, so if I could just have a second person kind of do what I'm doing, then I wouldn't have to always show up for work. So I, I just made, I made me. I made me, I'm like a mom. You cloned yourself?! Pretty easy. You could do it too, if you want. A day off. I would like a day off. But you might actually just want to make another one of me, because, I mean, I'm why everyone's here, right? Uh, anyway, today we're talking about Godzilla movies that almost happened. And oh my god, there are so many Godzilla films that were almost made. For every Godzilla movie you know of, there are like two or three that were discussed or even scripted, but never made it to the big screen. Many of these unused concepts morphed into the movies that we do have, but some more expensive and bizarre ideas are lost to history. For this countdown, I pulled five of the most interesting, oddest, and most WTF Godzilla films that were almost made, some making it all the way to conceptual art and storyboarding phases. These ideas are batshit crazy, so let's get going. Start us off, clickbait. Number five. Godzilla, King of the Monsters 3D. Well, the way back in 1983, director Steven Miner set out to make an American Godzilla film, and he had approval from Toho. At the time, Miner's only directing credits included Friday the 13th, Parts 2 and 3. But he'd later go on to give us Halloween H2O, Lake Placid, Soul Man. Soul Man. Miner hired William Stout to put together some conceptual sketches, and he had Dave Stevens develop numerous storyboards. The film was going to combine animatronics and stop animation. It would take place in San Francisco. A first draft of the screenplay by Fred Decker is actually available online. It had a dude with an eye patch, Russians, oh it was so 80s. But it would have been so cool to see an early 80s completely American Godzilla film with that horror thriller twist. And if this film were a hit, they wanted to follow it up with an American Rodan 3D film. So why didn't it happen? Miner was looking at a budget of 30 million dollars and studios didn't want to invest. 
Recall that in America in the early 80s, Godzilla was considered more of a children's property. And after a year or so of looking for backing, Miner just gave up. Number four. Yo, are you seriously gonna just not do anything? You wanna help? Godzilla vs. Deathla. This is a filmmaker named Yoshimitsu Bano. In the early 1970s, he was invited to direct a Godzilla film to revitalize the franchise. This resulted in the very avant-garde film Godzilla vs. Hedorah in 1971. This film has always stood out from the other Showa-era Godzilla films because of its odd mix of satire, environmental messaging, and psychedelia. And although history remembers this movie more fondly, at the time, critics had really mixed feelings about Godzilla vs. Hedorah. I mention this because through the 2000s, Bano was the driving force between a new IMAX Godzilla film called Godzilla vs. Deathla. And he was making it somewhat of a spiritual successor to his film Godzilla vs. Hedorah from decades earlier. Deathla would have even been similar to Hedorah in appearance, with a slimy texture and a human skull for a head. Oh, and he could turn into deadly mushrooms to feed on forests. When Godzilla attacks the fungus, it turns into a swarm of locusts and retreats. Godzilla would then chase the swarm using his flying ability once again. Godzilla and Deathla have a final fight in a snowy New York City, in which Godzilla protects a 9-11 monument. Oh yeah, I forgot to mention, this film had some 9-11 references sprinkled around it, which... I don't know. That kind of imagery probably doesn't mesh well with a Godzilla movie. Bano was in negotiations with Toho to get this film made without their financial backing, only their approval on the look and usage of the characters. The script went through some tweaks over time, and it would eventually be retitled Godzilla 3D to the Max, before landing on simply Godzilla 3D. But then along came Legendary Pictures with their own desire to make a Godzilla film, and by 2010, Bano's vision was forfeited. Although Bano did get to serve as producer on Legendary's Godzilla, as well as the upcoming sequel, King of the Monsters. Word is that Bano tried to rework his Godzilla 3D story into an IMAX Gamera film, and then later on, he was still trying to push a project with Hedora. But he unfortunately passed away in May of 2017, before any of these sequel ideas could be realized. Say what you will about Godzilla vs. Hedora, but I really respect how the director stood by it to the very end. Number three. Is that what my profile looks like? Godzilla versus Godzilla. And no, it's not Godzilla having an existential crisis crying in his own reflection. If you don't know, Godzilla dies at the end of the very first 1954 Godzilla movie. Spoilers, I guess. In the mid-80s, a film we know as Godzilla 1985 came out and acted as a direct sequel to the first film, ignoring all the films in between. In Godzilla 1985, it's made clear that a second Godzilla is now attacking. And that second Godzilla story would continue through the next several films, up until his own death in Godzilla vs. Destaroya! This string of films that share a continuity is known as the Heisei series. A film that almost made it to the Heisei series in 1995 was Godzilla vs. Godzilla, also known as Godzilla vs. Ghost Godzilla. In this film, the second modern Godzilla would have faced off against the ghost of the first Godzilla from the original 54 film! And I am sold! Stop drilling, you've hit oil! In one draft of the film, the ghost would possess a little Godzilla and grow into a reincarnation of Gojira. This is the actual concept art showing that reincarnation. You can see that the possession forces the little Godzilla's skin to stretch and tear. Other concepts came and went, including adding a Heisei version of Anguirus. Apparently, this idea was scrapped because the director felt it was too much to have Godzilla fight another version of himself for three films in a row. Since this film would have followed Godzilla vs. Mechagodzilla 2 and Godzilla vs. Space Godzilla. And that's too bad, because I've always loved this concept. But f*** me, I guess. Number two. So you're seriously not doing anything. Hello? 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 Do you think I did it wrong? Bride of Godzilla? Back to that first 1954 Godzilla film. 
Its first ever sequel was the 1955 film Godzilla Raids Again. After that, Godzilla didn't appear again until 1962, but originally, his third film was going to be released in 1956, and it was to be called Bride of Godzilla? Yeah, it was written as a question like that. I guess Godzilla wasn't sure if he wanted to commit yet. Now, when you hear Bride of Godzilla, you're probably thinking, oh wow, Godzilla's gonna meet some female Godzilla. And you'd be right. If instead of a female Godzilla, you actually thought of a giant, naked, humanoid robot woman. Yeah, a mad scientist named Dr. Sheeta builds this giant robot of a female human in the likeness of his foster daughter. As you do. And the film's treatment implies that she's naked. Because there are no giant-sized banana republics around, I guess. Also, this movie does some major Godzilla world-building, explaining that deep within the Hollow Earth, there are many Godzillas, and Anguiruses too. Anguiruses. Anguiruses. Along with other giant monsters, and mermaids! Yeah, there were also mermaids in a Godzilla film, and oh yeah, Dr. Sheeta falls in love with a mermaid. Jesus, at this point we might as well throw in, I don't know, a giant chameleon? Or a giant motherfucking flea? Wait, those are both in the movie too?! Yep, this film had it all. So Dr. Sheeta's giant robot, known to fans as Robot Daughter, or sometimes Robo Masume, defends Japan by fighting off these giant monsters. She tears off Anguirus' throat and tosses Godzilla around like a ragdoll. But then, Godzilla seems to fall in love with her. I guess he likes the aggressive types. He takes Robot Daughter to his private cave, and I feel like a G-Spot joke would go very well here, but I don't want to write it. But there is an actual line in a script where someone says of Godzilla, It is the foreplay of love to be beaten. Let them f***. But it's all a trap, as Robot Daughter is also a timed hydrogen bomb, and she explodes and takes Godzilla with her. I mean, at least he went out happy? I don't know. Number one. Oh, I knew I used too much kitty litter. Batman vs. Godzilla. Yup. If you didn't know, Godzilla officially exists in the Marvel Universe. This is due to the Godzilla title Marvel published from 1977 through 1979. But a decade earlier, Godzilla almost made his way to the DC Universe first. You see, in 1966, American culture had bat fever, thanks to the campy and colorful TV show starring Adam West. This hit show made its way to the big screen with Batman the Movie, and that movie almost had a sequel, I kid you not, Batman vs. Godzilla. How would that matchup even work? Look, I'll make that movie right now. I'm Batman. Squish. Done. Back up. Actually, two separate treatments exist for a Batman-Godzilla meetup. One treatment was by the future writer of Godzilla vs. Mothra, Shinichi Sekizawa. It was actually written two months before the Batman show started in America, and it's unclear what the story was behind this treatment, or if it was actually related to the Batman TV show. The second treatment is by an unknown American author under the direction of Batman producer William Dozier. And it's not clear if Toho was ever officially brought on board. This treatment is 20 pages and involves Batman and Robin in Japan facing off against a German meteorologist who has control over Godzilla. Of note, Batman and Robin battle sumo wrestlers, take a bullet train, and Godzilla kidnaps Batgirl, because we know those giant monsters love little human women. Batman actually scales Godzilla to plant a bomb on his neck, and then amazingly does not die of cancer from the radioactivity. They knock Godzilla out, then build a rocket around him and launch him into space. Everything about this treatment is bonkers, but man, it would have been a great movie. And which one of these movies would you want to see the most? What other unused ideas have you heard of that you love? Let me know in the comments below, and of course I want to thank my dear friend Clickbait! Well, today's been fun. Uh, turns out cloning, I guess, is not an exact science, as you can see. But, I mean, I gave it a shot, so... <laughs> Clickbait, you need to take that thing into the backyard and kill it right now. What? Oh, you're both on your phones now. Okay. Well, all right. Uh, goodbye.
put a little extra razzle-dazzle in this video and got to license some cool, recognizable songs. And that's possible in a big part thanks to these patrons! If you're in a position to contribute to the channel, like my man Irving Jimenez Begito, consider visiting Monster Island Buddies on Patreon. This video is sponsored by Jurassic Park, now on Broadway with live cloned dinosaurs. <laughs> Jurassic Park on Broadway has been canceled indefinitely. Hello everyone and welcome to the new top five. I'm your host, MIB, and we're also here with your friend, Clickbait. Hello, everyone. Well, welcome to the new Top 5. I'm your host, Clickbait, and we're also here with your friend, MIB. Are you ready for the countdown? No, Clickbait, I'm the host. Are you ready for the countdown? Whatever. As you all know, YouTube forces me to do these Top 5 videos in order to gain exposure with their slanted algorithms. And to be absolutely clear, we're talking about YouTube, not YouTube, which I'm sure is a fine sight. I don't know, I don't use it. Which reminds me, I need to check in with my YouTube account manager, Guy McMisterman. It's tingling, it's like tingling around here. Can you, oh hey, MIB, I just got back from Logan Paul's Zeppelin party. Lo Logan Paul owns a Zeppelin? Yeah, he owns a Zeppelin, do you know why? Because there is no God, just Ed Harris in a giant moon-shaped TV studio constantly f***ing with my life. Because he gets clicks. Look, I'm trying! I'm doing every gimmick I can think of over here! Don't come back until you give me those clicks! I need a quick boost in subscribers if I'm to own a Zeppelin. I know what I can try. A YouTube collaboration! Get me Jenny Nicholson! Get me somebody more in my popularity tier! Hey there, Teddy Rubskin here. Hey. A bear, great. I'm, I'm collabing with a bear. Well, what about you? You're just a pair of talking hands. <laughs> when you're right, you're right. Teddy, thank you for joining me for this countdown video. I'm MIB, and also meet my amazing co-host, Clickbait! Hey there, Clickbait. Hey. Hello, little pokey bear, pokey boo 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 Hello! I you so cute! You're also a little baby. A little baby face. No, no, f*** this, I'm out. I'm out. What? Ah, man! We blew it already! Nah, I'm just f***ing with you. <laughs> Today's countdown is about nudity! Since the dawn of civilization, humans have been fascinated with the naked body, dating all the way back to Frederick D. Hooter and Gail G. Breastyboop's groundbreaking research on the subcutaneous fat and tissues that make up the female breast. What the hell are you talking about? Well, let, let me do this f***ing intro, okay? <clears throat> Not many people know this, but there's been nudity in Godzilla movies, and other related Godzilla media. Yeah, when you think Godzilla, you might think of, you know, guys in rubber suits, bad English dubbing, PG-rated innocent fun, but there's been nudity in Godzilla. More specifically, female nudity, yeah. Now, of course, nudity standards are different in Japan than they are here in America, but it's still fascinating how incredibly random the entries on this list are. Most of them never serve the plot in a meaningful way, and they're not even there for sex appeal. They're just there! Hey, you better not censor those pictures. I have to, man! Otherwise I'll get hit with some stupid YouTube strike or something! What, for boobs? They're a natural part of the human body, who cares? The country was founded by prudes, Teddy. As much as I agree with you, I cannot show female nipples. But I can show my nipples! Because that's okay! <laughs> yeah. Count us down, clickbait! Number five. Gorgira, that's right, the 1954 movie that started it all. Unlike many of the sequels that focus more on fun and fantasy, the original Japanese Godzilla film was a bleak, depressing tone, grounded and much closer to reality. It's very graphic, with disturbing images of destruction, suffering, and also there is some brief nudity in the first Godzilla movie. Yeah, the movie starts with various ships and boats getting destroyed by Godzilla, then the film cuts to Odo Island, where the residents are waiting for a missing fishing boat, 
in, in one shot, you got these three topless village elders. It's <laughs> just standing there in the background. They, they, then you never see them again. They, they show the Oro Islanders many more times, but the topless women were just in the one shot. Not, not when you find a missing fisherman. Not, not, not when they're running from Godzilla. Never again. Right? But, uh, now, now mo most of you know that in America, they re-edited the original Gorgira and renamed it Godzilla. Or Godzilla King of the Monsters, right? Yeah. They, they even spliced in, uh, you know, Raymond Burr. <laughs> Perry Mason as a new main character. The, the America that is different. And, and, and it's a lot shorter. They, they cut a lot of content, so you probably, you know, think that they quick cut the shot of the nudity out, right? No. No. Those topless women are still there. The shot is a little shorter than the Japanese version, but it's still there. Did they plan on this? Or did a bunch of extras just show up one day and flash the camera on it there? <laughs> Whatever happened, this is nudity in the first ever Godzilla movie. Number four. Godzilla vs. Megalon. Quick question. After Godzilla's Revenge, which Godzilla film would you say is the most kid-friendly? To me, it's gotta be Godzilla vs. Megalon. One of the protagonists is a kid, it has doofy battle scenes that appeal to kids, hell, even Jet Jaguar was originally designed by a kid. This was the first Godzilla movie I saw as a kid, and I loved it. Again, I'm not saying it's a kid's movie, I'm just saying it's probably one of the most kid-friendly Godzilla films. Oh, except for the dirty magazines. Yeah, about halfway into the movie, we see these two kidnappers driving a truck. And for absolutely, positively, no reason at all, there are nudie magazine pinups right behind them in the truck! Now, we can only see one of the women's tatas because this guy's head is in the way of the other- No, wait, he moved. That's two naked ladies in Godzilla vs. Megalon. But why? Again, it's the sheer randomness that I find so fascinating. I know this movie was shot in just three weeks. Were they rushing so fast that they just used the director's own truck and forgot to remove his private nudie stash? Why is there nudity in Godzilla vs. Megalon? Did they just sneak it in there to wake guys up during the painfully boring middle act? I never even noticed the magazines as a kid. If I did, it might have been the first time I would have ever seen a naked woman in my life. But I was too busy fast-forwarding to this crap. I'm glad my priorities were in order. Number three. The Godzilla comic. Now hold up there, hands. Which Godzilla comic? The Godzilla comic. That's what it's called. It's a 1990 anthology manga that was only released in Japan. This anthology has 15 stories from different artists and writers. Well, a couple of these artists could not resist working in some boobage. Yeah, 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 but which Godzilla comic? You keep saying THE Godzilla comic. But which one is it? It's called THE Godzilla comic! In the anthology, there's a story called Last Scene. It's a more poetic story, which opens with a woman and a man in an apartment after what I believe to be with some sweet, sweet hanky-panky. They watch a news report about a Godzilla attack and see a live reporter get killed in a destruction. Godzilla's coming toward their location. The man goes to leave, but the woman poisons and kills him, and then lays on top of his body as Godzilla comes and destroys the building. The story, A Tiny Godzilla, features a humanoid alien who tricks a guy into having constant sex with her to help her build an army of slaves. Then she forces him to keep making love to her over and over. It's a good thing this isn't a list of the top five rapes in Godzilla because, well, Jesus Christ! But at least with both of these stories, the nudity is actually related to the plot. What do you send him in the drawings for? It's not even very detailed, it's like a noodle. You're censoring a W, two dots. Look, I don't know what the rules for comic book boobs are on YouTube, man! I don't know where the line is. You can't show a basic curved line with a dot? Well, when did it actually become a boob? Alright, let's find out. I'm gonna draw an image, and you tell me when it's a boob. Okay, go ahead. Alright, I'm drawing a curved line. It, it looks like there's a lot of you. And now I'm gonna put a dot within the U. Not unlike a single dotted close front rounded vowel. Mm. Here comes the dot. It's still not a boob. Okay, well I added a smiley face above the U. There's still not a boob. What if I add in some long lady-like hair? That's boob! That's a boob! Ah, ah, protect the children! My virgin eyes! Ah. Alright, Teddy, it's gone. 
Oh, thank fucking Christ. For a moment there, we almost exposed our innocent viewers to evil mammary glands that nourish our young. Take the next one, Teddy. Number two. Yeah, she's a hottie. <laughs> a space Godzilla. Yeah. <laughs> now, this is an official two-part story that was published in the Starlog magazine back in 1979. But it's nothing like any Godzilla story you've ever heard before. In this story, Godzilla's a female named Roseanne? Roseanne? <laughs> and she can fly through space like a rocket ship, and she comes from a whole planet of other Godzillas, you know? And in this story, some of the illustrations include uh, two pictures with nudity. In the first one, you see this humanoid woman with goat legs, and she's part of an alien race that invaded Godzilla's home planet. I mean, I mean this is a Godzilla story. This looks more like something you'd see in, like, magazine, like, Heavy Metal. Yeah, yeah, Heavy Metal is famous for combining dark sci-fi and erotica. And this story definitely would fit, would fit into fucking Heavy Metal, right? And, and what's this? Egyptian cat thing here. Well, it's got, like, a human face, and, and look, the cat's got boobs. <laughs> I bet you click this video, you weren't expecting to see Egyptian cat boobs. <laughs> and it gets even weirder, because then... The main villain appears, and she's this weird green lizard-like alien, and she's also, like, got huge cans. <laughs> what the hell is this story? I mean, her, her melons shoot Nazi swastikas. Like, for real. Can you imagine Godzilla fighting a giant green lizard with big boobs that shoot Nazi swastikas? I, <laughs> I can't. I, I can't even. I don't even know. Wait, Teddy, do you, are you okay? I don't know, I, I can't, I can't, I, I can't, I, 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 go on to the next one, mate. What the fuck? Number one. Terror of Mechagodzilla. Terror of Mechagodzilla, known in Japan as Mechagodzilla's Counterattack, premiered in 1975. It features a mad scientist named Shinzo Mifune, who has a daughter named Katsura. Mifune is working with aliens using Titanosaurus and a rebuilt Mechagodzilla to wipe out humankind. You know. Typical Godzilla plot. Oh, and Katsura is a cyborg! Yeah, there was an accident in the lab that injured her, so the aforementioned aliens made her a cybernetic human. The American version of this film is pretty badly butchered, and they watered down the language and even some of the violence. But in the American version, they also removed this scene here, which shows Katsura on the operating table having her cyber parts altered. And in a really bizarre twist, her boobs are out! It gets weirder, because those aren't the actor's actual jub-jubs. Those are mannequin boobs! Do you know what this means? Somewhere in time, someone said to the actor, we want you to go topless in our Godzilla movie. And she said, that makes no sense. And then someone from the prop department said, wait! And she ran off and either purchased or made fake boobs! Oh, no, hold on a hit second, Hans. If those are fake, then we don't have to censor them, right? I think we still do? But, but it's plastic. Nobody's naked. It shouldn't even be number one on the list. You should disqualify it. You make a good point, Teddy. All right, you win. I'm going to go ahead and uncensor them. Here we go, Teddy. Three, two... Man, what the f***? Boo! And we're back! I want to thank my new friend Teddy Rubskin for joining us today. Be sure to check out his YouTube channel for all sorts of funny review and editorial videos. Clickbait, say goodbye to Teddy. You're so freaking cute. I just can't get enough of your little face. Clickbait, knock it off. Oh, no, 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 it's fine, it's fine. I actually like it. Hell yeah. All right, then. I thank you again for letting me talk about bear boobs with an actual bear. Until next time, Hans. Keep it fucking real. Yeah, I really need a cool sign-off like that. Well, goodbye. This video was sponsored in part by these patrons, including Irving Jimenez Begito. Find Monster Island Buddies on Patreon if you'd like to support the channel as well. Thank you guys so much for watching. Don't forget to support our channel by liking, sharing, and subscribing. And don't forget to hit the notification bell so you never miss a video. This video is sponsored by... What? What the f***? I can't even read that! Who's
who's approving these sponsors? No, I want to know who's approving these sponsors. What does that say? You mother... Hey everyone, MIB here, and there are two types of people on this spaceship we call Earth. People who hate Valentine's Day, and people who are dumb. Why do we need a holiday just to celebrate the act of coupling? Terrible! And the worst part is how stupid and crazy people act around Valentine's Day. When they get all desperate for companionship. Blech. Anyways, let me introduce my co-host. Hello there, clickbait! Uh, hi... What's up, man? It's so good to see you. It's uh, nice to see you. Thank you for having me on. Um, you look so nice today. Uh, thanks. I just had a manicure, so... Also, I was just wondering um, if... Clickbait, what's up? Um, are you seeing anyone right now? Only a gentleman named Jack Daniels, if you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> Yeah. So let's, uh, you know, let's just start the show. Uh, Godzilla has crushed some of the world's biggest cities. He's defeated some of the toughest kaiju. But has he ever been in love? Has the big G ever been smitten by another monster? Or even a human? Today we count down five of Godzilla's former romantic interests. Oh yeah. You're really good at your job. Do you want to count us down? Number five. There's something different about the way she said number five. Some unnamed kaiju from an old Dr. Pepper commercial. The 1984 film The Return of Godzilla went through substantial edits for its American release. Actor Raymond Burr was spliced into the film along with a brilliant scientist, Dr. Pepper. This soft drink promoting movie was then released in American theaters as Godzilla 1985. And along with it came a $10 million Dr. Pepper ad campaign featuring two commercials with Godzilla. The first one has a thirsty Godzilla rampaging through a city trying out various soft drinks and being disgusted. Eventually, Godzilla finds a giant can of Dr. Pepper that's probably actually filled with rainwater, but he's happy. Fans call this Godzilla suit Pepper Goji, but I call him Meow. The second commercial takes place immediately after the first. Another kaiju appears and you know she's a girl because she got a cute little ball on her head. This monster doesn't look quite like a Godzilla. Her head's a different shape and she has two big bat signals shining from her eyes. Godzilla instantly tries to woo her with a tree bouquet, but she's not having it. So then Godzilla finds another giant can of soda, but this one's diet. What are you trying to say exactly? I've seen this female kaiju go by a variety of names online. You'll find her on Wikizilla as Newzilla. I've also seen Mizzilla. But either way, Dr. Pepper really upsets my stomach and gives me gas. I'm not, I'm not sure why that's, that's relevant to this. Dr. Pepper also produced a music video using shots from Godzilla 1985 and the song I Was Afraid to Love You, Surprise It's Awful. Number four. That's for you. All, all my life I've been waiting for the opportunity to talk about Godzilla getting with humans on YouTube. Godzilla's been depicted a few times being flirty with human women. Oh, do you know? Yeah, Godzilla! There's Dio, a native girl who appeared in Eberer Horror of the Deep. When Dio stumbles across Godzilla on a mountain, he acts, well, very un-Godzilla-like. He takes an interest in the woman going as far as to pop a squat and really study her. Something I know firsthand women don't like. Perhaps this scene makes more sense with the context that this was not originally written to be Godzilla, but rather King Kong infatuated with a woman. There's an old Hitachi karaoke machine commercial showing Godzilla leave work early after smashing a city just so he can sing karaoke with his very human wife, mother-in-law, and daughter? But my favorite humanoid flirtation is the manga story Monster Warrior Godzilla, where Godzilla and his friends are He-Man-type warriors in a world that combines medieval fantasy with cyberpunk sci-fi. 
The story takes place in a universe where humans and kaiju live in different dimensions, but an open doorway between the worlds has led to a terrible attack on the kaiju. You see, the humans have polluted the Earth, so now they want to take over the kaiju world. An injured Baragon explains to Godzilla that there's a magic wood nymph that kept the gateway to the human world sealed, but someone has taken her, so it is up to monster warrior Godzilla to save the wood nymph so the gateway can close and the kaiju can survive. Take my money! Take it now! The captured wood nymph, also referred to as the spirit of the beast tree, is represented as a closed flower with no stem but many roots. But after Godzilla fights through an ocean fleet, and a space fleet, and a super X fleet, the wood nymph blossoms from the flower and is revealed to be a gigantic, semi-naked humanoid girl. Godzilla embraces her tight as she's very grateful he fought to save her, and he says he'll distract the human forces while the wood nymph can escape and close the doorway. Godzilla, you're a brave warrior. Mm, wood nymph sounds. And after Godzilla fights off a wave of mechas, he's beamed home by the wood nymph in a super abrupt ending. And if there's one thing I do not like, it is a super abrupt end. Komodothrax! In the 1998 TriStar Pictures film Godzilla, Godzilla reproduces by himself. One of his offspring survives the movie, and that Godzilla is the center of the Saturday morning spin-off cartoon Godzilla the Series. Early in the series, they established that this new Godzilla is not able to reproduce at all. But in a season 2 episode titled End of the Line, he goes gaga for a kaiju named Komodothrax. This episode first aired December 18th, 1999. Nick's about to pop the question to Audrey during an Alaskan cruise, but they're attacked by a giant turtle who, Hey, get out of here, this isn't the Gamera crush list. Eventually, Komodothrax fends off this giant turtle. Komodothrax is said to be the same animal genus as Godzilla, maybe a monitor lizard, or perhaps a Komodo dragon. She even gained atomic breath like Godzilla. Speak of the devil and he shall appear. Here's Godzilla and uh-oh, straight to the mating. Yep, they've known each other for two seconds and that's just two seconds they could have been f***ing. Godzilla chases all the broke asses out of there because you need to pay to watch this action. Now here's the crazy part. Komodothrax lays an egg, but biologically the egg does not belong to Godzilla. You see, like the original Godzilla, Komodothrax is also able to reproduce on her own. Nick says she can fertilize her own egg, you Fox Kids viewers. Although, and this is actually the crazy part, technically this is entirely possible. It's called parthenogenesis, and it refers to when an unfertilized egg produces an offspring, and parthenogenesis has been observed at least twice with Komodo dragons. I don't know if this was intentional or a big coincidence, but I do know Nick would be technically wrong to suggest she can fertilize her own egg when an egg is unfertilized during Parthena- Stick to worms, Nicky! So the point is Godzilla is in love and ready to be an adopted father, and that's sweet. And it's a romantic story where Godzilla actually gets to live happily ever- Nope! The giant turtle from before kills Komodothrax and steals the egg! And when it looks like Godzilla is defeated by this turtle, Komodothrax springs back to life and pushes the turtle and then accidentally herself and then the egg all into a crevasse where they all plunge to their deaths. Enjoy the rest of your weekend, Fox Kids. Love only leads to tragedy. I'll call you sometime! <sighs> Number two. Gojirin! In 1994, two educational OVAs were produced by the company Gakin, featuring adorable cartoon versions of Godzilla and his friends. The title of the show is commonly translated in America as Get Going Godzilla Land, and its only official release is on VHS tapes. One video covered the hiragana alphabet, while the other taught children how to count. Two years later, in 1996, two more tapes were released in the series, Addition and Subtraction. The second two tapes were notable because they introduced a new original character, Gojirin. Gojirin looks remarkably like Godzilla, but she's a girl, so she's pink! Plus, she has long eyelashes, and her dorsal plates are the shape of hearts. 
The rough English language translation for her name is Godzilla. In the show, multiple monsters have a crush on Godzilla, and they try to woo her with gifts such as fruit. But at the end of the day, it seems Godzilla is only interested in dating within her species, as it's implied that her and Godzilla each have a crush on the other. By the way, if you haven't guessed, these OVAs are based on the 1984 merchandise line called Godzilland, and during the run of this line, the kaiju were often shown in different colors. And that includes Godzilla being occasionally portrayed as pink. So he kind of looks like his future crush here. Okay. Number... Sorry, oh. You're my number one. Okay, uh, hold that thought. Let me just wrap all this up real quick. Godzilla may have been Godzilla's childhood crush, but a different Godzilla source, known as Vegeta, was once established as his true girlfriend. In the 1990 Japanese Game Boy game Gojira Kun Kaiju Daikashin, Vegeta is kidnapped by several of Godzilla's friends and foes, and Godzilla has to progress through a maze of puzzles to find and rescue her. All of the Godzillas in this game are portrayed with clothes, so Vegeta has a little dress on. She has long hair, of course a little bow in it. She also has a little bow tied around her tail. Alright, that's cute. Going by the game's cover art, where Godzilla is light green and his mother is pink, it appears that Vegeta's skin color is ghostly white. But then here in the game, it looks like her skin is darker in color, so I don't know. All right, anyway, countdown over. Uh, so clickbait. Um, I may be wrong here, but I'm picking up some vibes between us today. What are you even talking about? What are you... No! No! <laughs> what? Come on, admit it. You like me. You're like my brother. You're like my son. <laughs> like, that is so weird. No. What about all that flirty stuff during the countdown? Come on. I'm just using this to try to, like, get, get some, get some butt. Get, get some ass around here. Oh. Okay, then. Well, you know what? At least it's not the Valentine's Day crazies. God, just love me already! Yeah! Why does this happen with everybody I meet? This is my curse. Goodbye. Every time I look into your eyes, I can feel love. Every time you Shout out to Irving Jimenez Begito, Kaiju Conversation, and all of these other wonderful patrons. Their contributions help to make this video possible. If you'd like to donate, please visit Monster Island Buddies on Patreon. Oh, the show's not over. The show's not over till I want it to be over, and I don't want it to be over yet because I love you. I love you. I would do anything that you ever wanted me to ever. I love... This video is sponsored by... Naked VPN. Unlike other VPNs that try to hide your internet usage, Naked VPN emails your internet usage history to everyone in your contacts. Let them know you're freaky. With Naked VPN. Hey folks, MIB here, and when you run a multi million dollar YouTube channel like I don't, you need to have a strong presence on social media. That's why I've decided it was time to get myself a social media manager. And even better, I hired within! Well, I mean, I only have one employee, but here she is! My new social media manager, Clickbait. Hold on one second. Ah, <laughs> uh, yes, I love that one. Okay, hold on. Hashtag blast. Oh. I've given Clickbait the password to all of my social media accounts, and she'll be working really hard to raise our awareness about our wait, endeavors. Wait, 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 MIB, I have a new app. It's gonna show us what our kid's gonna look like. Are you ready? Ready? Look how cute our kid is. Aww. Right now, let's make a hand baby. Great work, CB. Definitely post that on my Google Plus page. Anyway, today we're talking about crossovers. Godzilla has been around for over 65 years now, but the amount of time he's crossed over with other intellectual properties is surprisingly limited. On today's show, we're gonna look at five official crossovers that feature Godzilla. 
So let's go ahead and get started. Whoa, 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 hold on, MIB. It's world famous YouTuber Brandon Tennelt. What are you doing here, man? Don't tell me you're gonna do a whole episode about crossovers and not do a YouTube crossover. I mean, isn't that kind of a missed opportunity? So how about I guest host this one with you? Uh, yeah, but what do I need a guest host for? I've got clickbait. Right, clickbait? I'm gonna just put that cute little dog face on, but I gotta line it up to the dots. Hold on one second. Never mind. Welcome to our special guest host, YouTuber Brandon Tennell. We're gonna talk about five times Godzilla has crossed over with other properties, but first we need to establish some rules. Right, rule number one, the crossover must be with a property not owned by Toho, the owners of Godzilla. So we're not counting inner Toho crossovers like when Godzilla had that bromance with Zone Fighter. However, it is okay for properties where Toho handled the distribution. Rule number two, we're not counting times Godzilla met real life people. Sorry, Charles Barkley. Three, the crossover must happen in some type of medium that is currently accessible. So that Godzilla Gamera stage show I mentioned in a previous video, that's out. And last, Godzilla and the other characters must appear together. This rules out the PlayStation 4 game City Shrouded in Shadow, which features Godzilla, Ultraman, Gamera, and more, but never at the same time or even during the same level. Hybrid characters are also okay. With these rules in mind, let's get to the good stuff. Clickbait, do you think you could both manage my social media and the countdown? <laughs> okay. Five! Godzilla and Sanrio characters. Sanrio is a Japanese company that focuses on creating products for the cute side of Japanese pop culture, referred to as kawaii. It was founded in 1960, a point when Godzilla had only appeared in two feature films thus far. Sanrio has a ridiculously huge catalog of original characters, the most popular of which being Hello Kitty, who's achieved mainstream success in both America and Japan. In the mid-2010, Sanrio and Toho began teaming up to cross over Godzilla with some of their popular characters. Godzilla can be seen playing in the clouds with the Twin Stars, cozying up to Pom Pomperin, and playing with My Melody and Flat the Mouse. And of course, Godzilla is featured in art alongside Kitty White herself. In this piece, she somehow convinced Godzilla to wear one of her bows while she sits on his tail. And they're both flipping me off as if to say, Yeah, this is happening in a Transformers crossover isn't. F*** you. Well, and if you think that's strange, take a look at Hello Kitty King Ghidorah. This is included in the third wave of what's called the Narikiri Hello Kitty Collection, a set of keychains featuring Hello Kitty dressed as popular tokusatsu characters. And if a three-headed Hello Kitty Ghidorah is too much for you, there's a Godzilla in the collection as well. What a time to be alive. And we haven't even discussed Gudetama yet. Gudetama is a depressed egg yolk that really took off in Japan in the past few years, so naturally, his ass is always hanging out, wiggling around. Don't care. Can I go now? As you can see, his depression has rubbed off on Mothra. We have a depressed King Ghidorah. There's a Mecha Godzilla. Even Godzilla can't conjure up enough energy to go stomp on a city. What happened? Did they all just watch the Godzilla Netflix anime? Look at these stuffed toys. Look how deflated Godzilla looks. And Rodan looks like he's saying, oh my. Just remember that Toho turned down a crossover with Gamera, but they were okay with a bare-ass depressed egg. I feel like four could be trending, right? Should we trend four? Like, let's trend four. Godzilla and Marvel superheroes. In 1977, Marvel Comics was able to license Godzilla for a two-year, 24-issue series. They used this opportunity to write Godzilla into the Marvel Universe and have him interact with Marvel greats like the Incredible Hulk, Galactus, and a whole bunch of established Marvel monsters. Yeah! Brandon, Godzilla didn't actually interact with any of those characters during this run. Wait, so they had Godzilla, but they didn't have him fight guys like Fin Fang Foom? Well, who the hell did they put him up against then? Dum Dum Dugan! You know, that guy with the cigar and the bowler hat? Are you f***ing kidding me? Dum Dum Dugan sounds like an 80s WWF wrestler. Like the main event is Bam Bam Bigelow versus Dum Dum Dugan. And maybe Hacksaw Jim Duggan's in there somewhere. The good news is that over the 24-issue run, Godzilla did have some run-ins with popular Marvel heroes. It's not as many as you'd think, but they're there. 
You've got a team called the Champions, with Angel, Iceman, Black Widow, and Hercules. That was a real team? Kinda sounds like you're just naming random Marvel characters. I think even the Power Pack is more famous than those guys are. One time Godzilla shrunk down a little bit and took on the Fantastic Four, and toward the end of the series, he took on the Avengers. Okay, well did Godzilla at least meet Spider-Man? Please tell me he met Spider-Man. He did! Okay, good. For one panel, and technically they didn't meet. God f***ing damn it. I've gone on record about what I enjoy about this Marvel series, but when you think about it, there was so much stuff they could have done that they just didn't. Like, why not have Godzilla face an army of giant monsters sent from Monster Island by the Mole Man? Or what about all those giant monsters from the early issues of Tales of Suspense, like Clag, Goom, Kra? Are you naming monsters or are you choking on a fishbone? Godzilla's official comic run at Marvel ended in 1979 with the Big G walking into the sunset. The series is worth checking out, but in terms of Godzilla penetrating the Marvel Universe, this comic run only really scratches the surface. Godzilla and Evangelion the worlds of Godzilla and Evangelion have collided more than a few times, and it's fair to say that this started when Hideaki Anno, creator of Neon Genesis Evangelion, signed on to co-direct Shin Godzilla. As an April Fool's joke, and to promote his involvement with Shin Godzilla, Toho posted this crossover art on April 1st, 2016. This visual, featuring the Big G and Unit 01, might have started as a prank on us fans, but soon after, we started to get some actual, official crossover merchandise. That's right, fans were soon treated to figures that combined elements from both franchises, including special releases from X Plus like these two Kiryus, as well as this Ava Godzilla hybrid that'll spring to life and murder you if you say his name three times. Other collectibles include this SH Monster Arts Ava Unit 1 colored Godzilla, and figurines like this one of Rey holding a Godzilla. And of course, there's more merchandise we can cover, but we still have two more entries on this countdown to do. Plus, we want to get to the real big crossover event between these two, a ride at Universal Studios Japan called Godzilla vs. Evangelion, the real 4D. This temporary attraction opened on May of 2019. Guests play the role of an observational team sent by the government to observe strange electrical disturbances. They ride in a special aircraft that's soon attacked by Shin Godzilla. Evangelion units appear to fight off the Big G, but things get even more intense when a new form of King Ghidorah descends from the sky to join the Rumble. Universal Studios also offered some notable souvenirs for the ride, such as special mugs, trinkets, and so on. And also these incredible Unit 01 and Mechagodzilla heads that are actually popcorn buckets. But best of all, soft vinyl figures of both Shin Godzilla and the new form of King Ghidorah were offered as well. With this crossover still going strong, it's safe to say that we might see some more Godzilla and Evangelion together. And now that Anno is involved with a new Ultraman movie, who knows what kind of crossover surprises we might see in the future. Two, it's like a peace sign. Two, peace. Godzilla and Hamtaro. You know, whenever I think of Godzilla, a giant radioactive city-destroying dinosaur that began as an allegory for the horrors of nuclear weapons, I think the most logical thing to pair him with is... a small, adorable hamster. Yeah, obviously. And that's exactly what happened in the early 2000s. For anyone who doesn't know, Hamtaro is a series of Japanese storybooks and manga aimed at small children. This little guy started his career in 1997, and when he's not busy getting lost up Richard Gere's ass, you might also find him in video games, anime series, and even some full-length movies. Hamtaro films were distributed theatrically by Toho, and some of the movies were double-billed with new Godzilla films that were being released theatrically at the same time. As part of the promotion, movie theaters would offer small trinkets like these to the patrons. This started in 2001 with the movies GMK, Giant Monsters All Out Attack, and Totoko Hamtaro, the movie, Adventures in Ham Ham Land. That's a sentence I just said. This cross-promotion continued the following year with a pairing of Godzilla against Mechagodzilla, 
and Trottingham Taro the movie, Ham Ham Hamuja the Captive Princess. Or, as us true Ham Taro fans call it, THT MHHH TCP. And then finally in 2003, Tokyo SOS was paired with. Oh, Jesus Christ. Totoko Ham Taro the movie, Ham Ham Grand Prix, Miracles in Aurora Valley, Ribbon Chan's Close Call. I'm not sure if I just read you the movie title or the entire script, but I do know these little goji hams are fing adorable. Number one. Number one. All right. Hey, if Clickbait's doing two jobs today, does that mean you're paying her two salaries? Quiet, you. Godzilla and Ultraman. And Gundam. And Kamen Rider. To this day, franchises like Gundam, Ultraman, and Kamen Rider are amongst the most popular IPs in Japan. But did you know that these characters have been regularly teaming up in video games? The Compati Hero series is a category of games developed by Von Presto that started all the way back in 1990 with a sumo wrestling game for the Famicom. This 8-bit game features super deformed versions of the characters and their friends and foes, all living in one universe like a Japanese version of Toontown. For the next couple decades, dozens of new titles were made for the Compati Hero series, including side-scrollers, beat-em-ups, sports games, role-playing games, you name it. And in 30 years of these games, Godzilla and other Toho monsters have only appeared twice. The first time was in 1992, with Battle Soccer Field no Hasha for the 16-bit Super Famicom in Japan. The second game to feature Godzilla was Battle Baseball for the 8-bit Famicom. This game came out in 1993, and it's exactly what you think it is. Popular Japanese characters playing baseball. Soccer and baseball? How the hell is this the number one crossover on the list? I mean, yeah, I guess it's cool to see all these characters share a screen together, but I feel like this crossover could have been a lot more exciting. I'm glad you said that, Brandon! In 1993, the same year as the release of Battle Baseball, a Super Famicom game was released called The Great Battle 3. It's a Compati Hero series beat-em-up with a medieval motif. For one reason or another, this game was also adapted into a manga. I ordered a copy of the manga from Japan, and when I opened it, to my complete shock, I found that the story begins with the characters playing baseball! and Godzilla's right there, along with the other Toho monsters. So there's an official manga out there that has Ultraman, Gundam, Kamen Rider, and Godzilla all together. It's like the Ready Player One of manga. This little baseball game lasts the first few pages of the manga before the Toho characters exit the story and the main adventure begins. Honestly, this little comic here is one of my favorite things in the world. Somebody should make a manga of me, you, and Chris Kaisen playing baseball. Yeah, man. Yeah, I gotta say, it's kind of nice having someone else here who's, like, engaged with the show. Do you want to guest host permanently? Ooh, yeah, I'd love to, but uh, I'm in Canada, and the long-distance YouTube charges up here are outrageous, so that's all for now. Until next time. Did he just... Did he just leave? Uh, well, I... I I guess it's just you and me again, clickbait. Hashtag butts, my favorite. Hashtag my most favorite butt. Hashtag butt jokes. Hashtag butt girl. Yeah, she's really messing with my brand. Everybody knows I'm a boob guy. Well, goodbye. <laughs>
Greetings and welcome to another MIB Top 5 show. I am MIB and with me as always is my countdown co-host, Clickbait. Hello everyone and hello George Lucas. If you're watching, which I hope you are, um, I'm a huge fan of the Star Wars and I think I would be perfect for the next The Star Wars. Um, so if you are watching, please use this as my audition tape. No, 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 no. Do not use this video as your audition tape. I'm going to show you a little bit of everything that I can do because I'm a pretty great actress. George Lucas doesn't even own the Star the fucking Star Wars. Yeah, consider me for your next The Star Wars. Yay. That's not even a picture of George Lucas. R2D2, where are you? God damn it. You might remember a previous video where we counted down five WTF moments in Godzilla's 65 plus years of existence. Yeah, the really peculiar moments that most people don't even know happened. Today, I've compiled another list of five WTF Godzilla items. Now, I'm not saying these are more or less WTF than the previous list. They're just five more moments that will have you scratching your heads and staring in disbelief. Let's dive right in. Count us down, CB! Five! There is a lot to unpack here, and I know you have questions. As well you should! In 2018, Toho launched a marketing effort in Japan to bring small children into the world of Godzilla. The campaign is centered around this guy, dubbed Chibi Godzilla. Yup, Godzilla is now a little green bear with broccoli hair. And he's in the middle of a marketing blitz. There are already two children's books, plushies, and other Chibi Godzilla merchandise. But there's also special Chibi Godzilla events for children, as well as promotional appearances by the Chibi Godzilla mascot. As of this video, this campaign is still very alive and well. Then in 2019, as part of Godzilla's 65th anniversary celebration, Toho released a music single called Goji Goji Chibi Godzilla. This thing's a little bit of an earworm. It's easy to get this song drilled into your skull. Trust me, I'm the guy that had to edit this video. Along with the release of the single, Toho debuted a promotional music video that... Well, it really gets your attention. So who's the almost naked guy in this children's music video? Well, his name is Yoshio Kojima. He is a Japanese comedian, and dancing around in a tiny bathing suit is sort of his shtick. He's a staple of Japanese game shows and such, uh, often showing off his abs while doing a silly dance and shouting a catchphrase or two. Eventually, his career brought him into the kids' market, as he'd promote Disney XD in Japan. Oh! He even toured elementary schools and, oh my god, can you imagine a dude trying this in America? FBI, open up! To Japanese audiences familiar with Kojima, this video is a cute collaboration. To everyone else, this video is GET THAT GUY AWAY FROM THE CHILDREN! At the 2019 Godzilla Fest in Japan, Kojima and Chibi Godzilla performed their song live. Sadly, there's no word on an international mall tour. Sex! Who doesn't love some consensual coitus? But what if, just as you're about to do the hippity dippity, you find out there's a kaiju right outside your house? Do you evacuate or ejaculate? Sorry, not sorry. In 2014, a Japanese magazine called Big Comic Original put out a special Godzilla issue to celebrate the upcoming Hollywood Godzilla film. A thing you should know about Big Comic Original is that it is considered a seinen manga. A manga that's made specifically for young adult men. With that in mind, we shift to Godzilla Couple, a story in this issue written by Shinzo Kiego. It stars Ma Kun and Kyoko, a couple who just moved in together and are hanging out in their new home, while the news reports on Godzilla absolutely ravaging Tokyo. 
The JSDF attacks Godzilla, knocking out the couple's power, but also making them believe that Godzilla is now dead. So naturally, it's a good time for a dude to go down on a lady. But as he's convincing her it's go time, they hear something in the distance. Godzilla lives! Makun begins to pack for the shelter, but Kyoko has a thought. If they go to the shelter, they can't have sex now, can they? And you can't argue that logic! So as the military attacks Godzilla right outside their window, the young lovebirds have at it. And it goes on like this, intercutting between the army desperately trying to kill Godzilla and the couple having sweaty, filthy sex. I bet you wouldn't mind Godzilla movies cutting to the humans if that's what they were doing, eh? He makes it to the couple's house just as they climax, stomps his foot right at their door, and then he just kind of fucks off somewhere. Let them finish, he says. Right about here, I believe the roof collapses, and as the birds fly over them, the couple decides that they should do it again. The end. What a hot story! This is the kind of shit that bings my berries. Filthy sex while Godzilla's right outside? Fuck yeah, that's my kind of kink. I want that. It would be even better if there were two chicks and two kaiju, and we kick off the whole thing with the girls sticking their fingers right between... Our Monster Force, Young Boy Volume. Oh, just saying that title makes me feel sketchy. For every battle you've seen Godzilla partake in throughout his filmography, there are 20 battles he has had in other media, and some of that media is incredibly obscure. For a good example, look no further than this vintage 33 and a third vinyl album released by Toho Records. We know at least five original Godzilla stories were scheduled to be released as records, with completely original foes for Godzilla, such as these Drakund aliens, as they're called. The story we're gonna focus on in this entry comes from this record, titled Our Monster Force Young Boy Volume. And if you're wondering, there's the young boy right there on the cover, riding Godzilla like there's not a dorsal plate spike going right in his ass. When you play the album, you hear a complete narration of the new story. The young boy's name is Tadashi, and he's super into reading about famous kaiju like Godzilla. One day, he dozes off while studying, and he gets abducted by a flying saucer. Inside the saucer, he meets Asfar, from the planet Alfar, who has chosen Tadashi to save the Earth. They give him a costume and a body as hard as steel. Tadashi is now a space boy. Soon after, an earthquake topples the Statue of Liberty in America. Tadashi teleports himself underground and he finds the monster responsible, this amoeba-looking thing called Naamon. <laughs> Tadashi can now understand kaiju language, so we actually get to hear Naamon talk. <laughs> Naaman proceeds to kick the shit out of Space Boy, whose powers only really lasted 10 minutes. Tadashi calls out for Godzilla, who I guess arrives immediately and kills Naaman effortlessly. <laughs> Tadashi then wakes up in his house the next day but finds a newspaper confirming the earthquake was indeed real. So yeah, in terms of Godzilla stories, this is definitely a Godzilla story. I mean, it's definitely a product of that time when Godzilla was positioned as a friend to the children or whatever. Guess he shrunk himself down a little too. Not sure whatever happened to Tadashi, but I like to think that Space Boy became Space Man, and he's out there flying around somewhere for like 10 minutes or so. Oh, hello. Number two. Oh, you guys are so lucky she's not doing this awful Wicked Witch impression she does. In 1978 and 1979, American audiences were treated to two seasons of the Hanna-Barbera Godzilla cartoon. This is the one where he's got the nephew named Godzuki. There was not a lot of official merchandise for this cartoon show. There are these stuffed toys from Knickerbocker that look nothing like Godzilla and Godzuki. There's a lot of packs of puffy stickers like these. And there are three coloring books. This entry is about one of them, Godzilla Jokes and Riddles. 
But before we dive in, I just want to thank RetroReprints.com, where you can download this entire coloring book for just $4. Okay, so what's so crazy about Godzilla jokes and riddles? Now, first of all, this book is kind of full of shit. It's cover to cover with jokes. I didn't see any riddles. And oh my god, these jokes! 65 pages of absolute groaners! Why did Godzilla cross the road to stop on the other side? What did Godzilla wear to ballet class? Lizard tards. How do baby Godzillas play in the winter? They have fireball fights. Also, sh baby Hanna-Barbera Godzilla's confirmed. I would say a good 40% of this book is lizard puns, 40% is fire puns, and then the remaining 20% is just absolute what the f***. What is Godzilla's favorite James Dean movie? Reptile without a cause. Number one, this looks more like a James Bond than a James Dean type. And then is this implying that James Dean is a Godzilla? Who does Godzilla dance with at Studio 54? Lizard Minnelli. Oh, fuck you. Fuck you with that. Lizard Minnelli. Fuck. Why did Godzilla get a divorce? He's a homewrecker. Was, was that pun even worth it? Now Hanna-Barbera Godzilla is a divorcee. But then a little later, what is Godzilla's wife's name? Goddesszilla. Oh, oh, oh boy, gentlemen, control those boners. This is Goddesszilla. Which, by the way, I thought he was divorced. Is this who he divorced? And then literally two pages later, where did Godzilla take his girlfriend? To the fireman's ball. Is this Godzilla's side piece? He really is a homewrecker. I bet he got with Lizard Minnelli, too. Jesus, Lizard Minnelli, fuck you. Some of these jokes I just don't get. What is Godzilla's favorite snack? Trains. There's a lot of product placement in here. There's a reference to scope mouthwash. There's a reference to Rolaids. Here's a reference to Coca-Cola. Why is Coke in Godzilla's contract? It's the claws that refreshes. That feels more like a Coke joke than a Godzilla joke. Also, everybody knows Godzilla prefers Dr. Pepper. What did Godzilla do to the man who hadn't a bite in three days? He bit him. <laughs> All right, that, was, that one was pretty funny. This book is amusing for the art. I'd say Godzilla spends more time in this book than he does in his own Hanna-Barbera TV show. But Lizard Minnelli, f*** you. <laughs> No, stop, 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 no! Number one, my pretty! CB, no! Right here, you might be wondering, what Godzilla moment is so utterly insane that it would make the number one spot on this list? What piece of Godzilla history could go toe-to-toe -to -toe with the likes of a space Godzilla, the number one entry on the last list? The answer to that is a manga called Warning from G. You might remember in the last countdown, I mentioned a 1990 anthology called The Godzilla Comic. This anthology was the home of Monster Warrior Godzilla and Tiny Godzilla, both of which were on the last countdown. But in that video, I somehow failed to consider Warning from G, which is so insane that it makes those other two stories look like Goodnight Moon in comparison. In this story, Godzilla is attacking while a couple watch helplessly. The man, Kentaro, decides that if he uses special martial arts called Kopo, he can stroke specific chakra points on Godzilla's body, the points that regulate Godzilla's energy. He tells his wife to take care of their unborn child, and then he charges at Godzilla. He leaps into the air and strikes Godzilla, effectively killing them both. We jump ahead in time a little bit to where the baby is now born. The mother and baby visit Kentaro's gravesite, asking him to watch over them from the afterlife. And that's when the baby reveals that he is actually Godzilla! Yeah. The baby begins speaking. So Godzilla is talking now, through a baby, to the baby's mother. Yeah, Godzilla took over the baby's body at birth and returned to the living to seek revenge for his death. But why does he gotta take it out on a wife and child of his murderer? Because Godzilla is a stone-cold asshole! Godzilla claims he'll grow up to look like Kentaro, and he'll learn the same martial arts technique. The mom pleads for Godzilla to give the baby its body back, but he just taunts the mother by tossing rocks at her. And finally, the baby leaps into the air holding a rock and smashes the mom's skull with it! He beats her repeatedly with it, 
until the mom does what appears to be a martial art palm blow right to the baby's face, sending him flying back. Godzilla has done a lot of awful stuff, but possessing a woman's baby, then taunting that woman, and beating her with a rock until she's forced to kill him? I mean, damn, Godzilla. Damn. The good news is that the entire family is reunited in the afterlife. The son, now appearing older, says he's been learning Kopo from his dad in the spirit world. They also see that in the spirit world, the earth is rotting from the inside out. They conclude that Godzilla's appearance was a warning from the spirit world. If anger and destruction continue, there will be no future for Earth. Wait, so the spirit world doesn't want anger or destruction, so it sends Godzilla? How does that work? And what if the baby didn't die? Is there a little five-month-old walking around right now with Godzilla inside his body? Anyway, those are five more WTF Godzilla moments. Which was your favorite? Let us know in the comments below. All right, CB, wrap this thing up. Thank you, everyone, so much for watching and to George Lucas for considering this as my audition tape for the Star Wars. And I will leave you with my death scene. As I die, eh, uh, uh, oh, help me! Well, it's still better than Rise of Skywalker. Goodbye. Help! Oh, he shot me! Oh, it This video is sponsored by... Are you in trouble? Do you need some help getting off? Then call now to hear hot, horny girls give you legal advice. If you're in danger with the law, call 1-800-Klondike-5-GET-YOU-OFF. They provide 24-hour consultation on everything from white-collar federal offenses to local misdemeanors. And you'll hear it all from hot, horny girls. $12 the first minute, $25 each additional, but you'll only need that first minute. I'm legally obligated to mention that you can't actually see the hot girls, and though they are horny, it's not for you. Oh, I know what you're thinking. It's been over a year since the last Top 5 show. Well, I haven't been uploading, but I have been making them. It's just... My co-host has been difficult to work with lately. Well, here's one clip from the unaired Top 5 Overpriced Godzilla items. Please welcome to the show my co-host, Clickbait! Did you see what I did? I got it to my nose. <laughs> I told you to stop coming to work drunk. I don't know what I would do if I didn't have this job. Because you're my best friend. You keep doing this. You look for literally any reason to drink. I'll drink to that. Boop. I didn't get to air that countdown. But if you're wondering what the top overpriced Godzilla items are, it's all of them. It's, it's all of them. Here's a clip from the unaired episode, Top 5 Times Godzilla Queefed on Camera. Please welcome my co-host, Clickbait! Clickbait, are you drunk again? <laughs> oh my god, no, 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 no. I'm not, I'm good. Oh f now you're high. <sighs> you like me. <laughs> anyway, let's try this. Please God, welcome to the show, Clickbait. What? You want me to do you want me to do this thing? Yes, yes. Well, then you know what you have to do. What? You know what you did. And if you don't know what you did, then uh, it's even worse. What did I do? I'm I'm not going to tell you because you should know. All right, well, the boomer viewers are getting impatient. So let's start I the show. I told you I'm not I'm not I'm not we're not doing this until you apologize. You, you disgust me. I'm sorry for upsetting you. 
Now let's start the show. You don't even know why you're sorry. My viewers are dropping like flies! They take toys of radioactive dinosaurs very seriously! We need to start! What are you sorry for? I'm sorry for airing the drunken high footage of you when I promise not to. Nope. I'm sorry for crying so much. In general. Nope. I'm sorry I drank your bathwater. What? No. Oh god, I'm gonna start. I'm gonna start crying now! You've done it! Can we please just start the show? <laughs> Fine, uh, I'll do the countdown, but just know it's not for you. You're in the doghouse, okay? I'm doing it for the viewers. Okay. And greetings, everyone that skipped to this time code. Jerks! These days, there is an absolute abundance of Godzilla merchandise in the world. It's truly incredible how much there is as of this video, even if it's not Star Wars levels of merchandise. But it all had to start somewhere. I'm going to be doing just a general overview of the very first Godzilla merchandise ever in the world, with a focus more on toys and games. There are a lot of resources and acknowledgements for a video like this. For example, this 1992 Japanese book titled Godzilla Toy Museum. In here you'll find this image of a gun pointed into Godzilla's mouth. This gun fired wooden arrows with rubber suction cups on them. As you might guess from this art, this was released in Japan around the time Godzilla Raids again premiered there in 1955. And this appears to be the very first licensed Godzilla toy ever made. A gun. That looks like the one Jack Nicholson pulled out of his pants in Batman. And that was it! For eight years! Until... Clickbait. Five founded in 1907 ideal would become the largest doll making company in the united states during the post world war ii baby boom they gave us patty play pal and betsy wetsy what more do you need to know in 1962 godzilla returned to u.s movie theaters for his third outing king kong vs godzilla and in 1963 ideal gave us the board game godzilla game Yes, one of the earliest pieces of official Godzilla merch is American. Godzilla game features this game board with illustrations of the Big G, and I have to believe this is New York City he's attacking in 1963. It would make sense as Ideal was located in Hollis, Queens at the time. I would be remiss if I didn't mention the similar King Kong game also put out that year by Ideal. This art is more inspired by his original 1933 appearance, and he is definitely in New York, but he is also giant size, much closer to the size he is in King Kong vs. Godzilla. Fun fact, Ideal's biggest claim to fame would come in 1980, when they licensed and sold the Rubik's Cube. And what's interesting is that the next entry on this countdown, one that really got the merch train going, is also an American release. For... This next entry isn't just also American, but also New York based. And it might be the most iconic piece of Godzilla merch ever made. Aurora Plastics Corporation is a toy and hobby manufacturer founded in 1950, but they made some big strides in the 1960s. This is when they acquired a license from Universal Studios to create a line of models based off of their famous movie monsters. In the early 1960s, they provided kits for Frankenstein's monster, Dracula, the Wolfman, all the classics. Then in 1964, they added some giant monsters into the mix. They licensed RPO Pictures' King Kong and Toho's Godzilla. Kits like the Godzilla kit here would often be re-released. In this case, a glow-in-a-dark version debuted in 1969. Godzilla would also be one of the monsters to get a go-kart in 1966. Sometime later, in 1975, Rodan and King Ghidorah would receive their own model kits from Aurora. But going back to this original Godzilla kit in 1964, its success is what kicked off a tremendous domino effect in Godzilla merch. The effects of which we're still feeling today. You see, over in Japan, a toy company called Marasan took the Aurora Godzilla design, made some slight modifications, and released it as a model kit on that side of the ocean. And as monsters became bigger pop culture hits in the mid-1960s, things were about to really heat up. Three. In 1966, for the first time ever, Marasan began releasing soft vinyl toys of monster properties. 
This included characters from the new Ultra shows, and monsters from Toho movies as well, including Baragon, Mothra, Gorosaurus, Ibra, and Godzilla. And as you can see, the Aurora model's influence is still present here in the first Godzilla soft vinyl toy ever made. Godzilla also got to join Ultra characters in this line of cute toys and banks. More characters would soon follow, and Morrison would also begin releasing tin toys, wire control toys. Japanese Godzilla collectors were finally getting options. Morrison the company bankrupted in 1968, but out of the ashes of that came new companies, one called Bullmark. Bullmark would then re-release molds, add characters, and they too would attempt to expand to other types of toys. But Bullmark was not without its competition. <sighs> oh! Two! Poppy is a Japanese toy manufacturer founded in 1971, and their big success was releasing die-cast metal robot toys, referred to as Chigokin, a term that originated in Mazinger Z. But over at Bullmark, as the monster fad began to decline, so too did their sales. So Bullmark took a page from the Poppy book and released die-cast toys of their licenses. And that's why we have these incredible half-robot missile-firing kaiju toys. But these toys failed to match the success of the Poppy toys, and by 1978, Ballmark was facing bankruptcy. So who nabbed the Godzilla license next? Poppy! Poppy, of course! Before we move on to number one, just some items worth a quick mention. Back in 1965, King Kong trading cards with comical word balloons were released in America. A handful of these cards would include Godzilla as well. In the early 1970s, as Godzilla's audience grew younger, Toho would begin packaging their Godzilla movies with cartoons and such for children. It's here that Asahi Sonorama began releasing records and books with original artwork, that cool kaiju anatomy, and new monster mashups. And we're not even getting into the manga right now, but yeah, manga. But let's get back to our timeline with the number one entry. Clickbait. One. Yeah. One. Yeah, we can stay on one all day long. One. 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 In the late 1970s, after acquiring the Godzilla license, Poppy released the Jumbosaurus, one of the most sought-after Godzilla collectibles to this day. Let's take a closer look at this beast. First, a quick size comparison. Make no mistake, this Godzilla was indeed Jumbo. He's got a little bit of articulation. He's got wheels on his feet for easy movement. He fires his fist! I guess, I guess at this point, this was a function kids just expected from their toys. And he's got this pulse string, which provides the famous Godzilla roar. Even now, holding a Jumbosaurus, it gives off the impression of a good, well-made toy. And here's where our timeline is going to end in Japan for today's purposes, but what's going on back at the States? Enter Mattel. In the late 1970s, even Mattel was trying to capitalize on the success of Shogun Warriors, importing many of these figures in different sizes to sell in the States. This line lasted a few years, but toward the end, Godzilla was added to the lineup. While similar, the Shogun Godzilla toy has some head-scratching differences from its Jumbosaurus counterpart, chief being the different, less screen-accurate head sculpt. Like, wh what happened here? Gone is the roar function, but instead there's a red lever which makes him either stick out his tongue or spit fire. Honestly, I don't think even Mattel knew which of the two functions this was meant to be. You control Godzilla's ugly tongue. Imagine his breath is a blast of fire. But hey, at least it still fires his fist. And this is also the time where both Shogun Warriors and Godzilla began appearing in Marvel Comics. Back at Mattel in 1978, they would license molds from Poppy to create the very first American Godzilla toy line, Godzilla's Gang. You may have noticed something a little bit off about his gang. Yeah, except for Godzilla, every monster in this line is a Subaraya-owned Ultra Monster. 
Real quick, something I actually really like about this toy line, though, is how each figure has a unique footprint. That's a really nice touch. In 1979, Rodan would join the Shogun Warriors toy line, although instead of being labeled as a Shogun Warrior, he was labeled as World's Greatest Monsters. This Rodan toy is huge, with a wingspan of over 38 inches. He's got great neck articulation and a lever for his mouth. He's got finger holes for grips and rubber bands to help him mimic a wing flapping motion. And he's got claws of doom. Around this time period is also when Mattel released Godzilla Game, a really fun game in which you take turns moving your ships while at any moment, Godzilla himself can pop out and snag one. And you might have noticed this game has the exact same name as the Godzilla board game that kicked off this list. Godzilla Game. Not even, not even a the. There's more, there's so much more. There's the infamous 1978 Ben Cooper Halloween costume. 1978 is also the year of Hanna-Barbera's Godzilla cartoon, and that too brought some merch, including puffy stickers and these stuffed toys from Knickerbocker. Around here is when Viewmaster starts using Godzilla. HG Toys acquired the license to Godzilla and put out puzzles and a playset. Speaking of puzzles, let's not forget Godzilla King of the Creatures. There's just too much to possibly cover in one video at this point. Suffice to say that in the late 1970s and early 1980s, the Godzilla merchandise floodgates were finally opening, and it was a good time to be a fan. All of this was just a quick summary, but there are numerous great books and blogs by people who enjoyed these toys in their youth, and give a more thorough first-hand account of their experiences with them. I hope you check them out, and I hope you share your own memories of Godzilla merch in the comments below, whether we covered them today or not. So we went through this whole thing, this whole thing, and you still don't know what you did? Can you please just tell me? You didn't like my post! How could you not like my post? I like all of your stuff! Every single day, and your stuff isn't even good! This was... this was all about an Instagram post? We're supposed to be friends! You know, like, friends like each other's posts! You know, and I, 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 I thought that our friendship was more than that! Like, I thought that we were there for each other! I thought that we supported each other! I thought that we... No matter what, we're gonna go in and make sure that we were there for each other. And you, you didn't do that. And it really hurt my feelings. Oh, CB, I, I feel the same. I never try to disrespect you. Truth be told, you're the only other person I have on this channel. And I have to pay you to be here. But we've done so many top fives together now, and I want you to know you really, really mean a lot to me. And I'm sorry. It's fine. It's fine, whatever, you know? It's like, just, just like, like my post, okay? Okay, all right, I'll, I'll like this picture of, what is that, dog shit? Blurry dog shit? Anyways, I liked it, are we still friends? Yeah, we're friends. This is good. I feel this is good. I feel like you and me are gonna be doing this show together for a long time. <laughs> This video is sponsored by... New on Audible, the Bible, as read by YouTuber Monster Island Buddies, in all of his wacky voices. And God said, Let the waters under the heavens be gathered together into one place, and let the dry land appear! And it was so! And God called the dry land Earth, and it was good! 
May the Lord strike you with Egyptian boils and with tumors and scarabs and itches for which you'll find no cure. That's what happened. No one whose testicles are crushed or whose male organ is cut off shall enter the assembly of the Lord. What the hell is this book? <laughs> Hey everyone, it's good to be back hosting the top five sh MIB, thank God you're here. It's my YouTube representative, Guy McMisterman. What's wrong, Mr. McMisterman? I fell on hard times, I need to borrow some cash. What happened? I got MC hammered. Oh, you owe back taxes to the IRS, huh? I got no money to give you. What's clickbait up to? <laughs> she doesn't have any money either. I know that because I'm behind two of her invoices. But uh, what I really need from you is, uh... Clickbait's number, you know? You, I, I know you're really Get close to Get out of here. here! What? Come on! <laughs> Great, now I have to tell my co-host Clickbait we don't have a YouTube representative anymore. Well, first let's intro the countdown. Thanks to over 65 years of pop culture history, most people have the same ideas and expectations of what a traditional Godzilla looks like. Big. A T-Rex type with giant dorsal plates and longer arms. A lumbering giant dragging its long tail- you get the idea. In modern media, new and different interpretations of Godzilla have become more prevalent. Yet creative minds were thinking outside the box for much longer than many people realize. Today, we're gonna look at some wild, alternate versions of Godzilla and other Toho monsters throughout history. Clickbait, are you there? Oh. Oh, like... y you okay? Oh, man. Hi. Hi. CB, what happened? <sighs> Tell me what happened. But let's do it with a recreation using toys. I was standing at the bus stop, and suddenly, a piano fell from a building and killed the guy right next to me. Jeez. CB, I'm so glad you're okay. But it got me thinking about how fleeting life is and how I've been spending my life so selfishly when I should be doing more, getting out there and helping people. I don't think I'm... I'm not a good person. I, sh I should have been the one under the piano. But nobody deserves to be killed by a piano. What am I doing? Like, what am I doing here? What, what am I doing with my life? I don't think this is that bad a job. Unpaid invoices aside. Why, why am I even here? Why am I standing here in front of, like, just a camera when I could be helping people? CB, don't do it. Don't go down that rabbit hole. Oh, I'm freaking out right now. Okay, okay, let's just try to take your mind off it a little bit and do the countdown. Five WTF versions of Godzilla and his friends. Clickbait, can you, can you say five? Five! Godzilla manga is crazy. The best stuff is in manga, both unofficial and official. And I'm only gonna scratch the surface of some of the sheer creativity out there. But believe me, I'd love to talk to you for hours about Mecha Titanosaurus. And a Shin Godzilla that morphs into a Shin Ghidorah. I really like Godzilla King of the Monsters, the two-volume manga that collects a serialized Godzilla comic that ran from 1992 to 1993. The final boss in this comic is King Godzilla, who we've talked about before. This is that Godzilla clown with Batra wings, King Ghidorah arms and legs, and a Biollante in his chest. But this comic gave us some other cool monster variations. Mutations created by the evil Dr. Oniyama. Like Sea Baragon. A version of Baragon with no ears, walrus tusks, and a large narwhal-type horn. He got disintegrated by Godzilla. How about everyone's favorite giant lobster, Ibera? Let's give him some dragonfly wings! So he can fly all up in Godzilla's face during a relaxing summer day. Aw, oh, Godzilla ripped those wings right off. And then punched a hole right in him. I like the time Dr. Oniyama retrieved Mechagodzilla's living brain and created Mechagodzilla 3. I've already brought this manga up on the show a few times. This is the 1990 anthology comic called The Godzilla Comic. And this is where we find a tiny Godzilla, sexy monster warrior Godzilla, and that baby that was possessed by the ghost of Godzilla. Seriously, just, just watch these two videos. But we haven't talked a lot about this anthology sequel, 1992's The Godzilla Comic Raids Again. And where do I start? Here's a comic with a fight between Godzilla and King Ghidorah, but they look like these, the Bonpresto brand plushies. That's pretty, that's pretty cool actually. All right, never mind. 
And in this story, Biollante and King Ghidorah fight in outer space. Biollante absorbs a beam from King Ghidorah and uses the energy to turn into a hybrid Biollante King Ghidorah clone thingy. But I want to talk about a story called Godzilla New Comedy. In this story, there are brief glimpses of three wildly different takes on Godzilla. There's Moon Crater Godzilla. No, I'm joking. This is Cancer Cell Godzilla. Isn't regular Godzilla Cancer Cell Godzilla? This Michelin tire looking Godzilla is Leukocyte Godzilla. Yeah, leukocytes are basically white blood cells in our body. And I could give you 100 guesses for what the third Godzilla is, and you'll never get it, because it's Sperm Godzilla. A Godzilla that's sperm. You go to those other Godzilla YouTubers for current events and reviews of new things. You come to Monster Island Buddies for Sperm Godzilla. Let's just say I feel bad for the egg. Four... Toy Card was a series of collectible cards released in Japan from the late 1980s through the early 1990s. It was released in two series, Godzilla Wars, which included three sets, and Godzilla War Chronicles. Each Godzilla Wars card featured a Toho character in this art style, along with some stats, an encrypted message, and a character quote. You'll find familiar faces in here, Gabara, Gigan, Jet Jaguar. But these cards are also where you'll find some unique variants of characters, like Super Jet Jaguar, Full Armor Jet Jaguar, Adult Manila, yeah, Manila finally grew up, Gigan Mark II, Hyper Mogira, Second Generation Anguirus, even Mecha Megalon. Now that's badass. There's more, Hundred Eye Hedora, Armored King Caesar, Full Metal Gigan, Gabara with children. Oh god, he's procreating. It is awesome to see new variants of these familiar characters. You'll find this art in other places like activity books, some of which include puzzles where multiple monsters are combined into one. Look at this monstrosity! How about this guy? A weird hybrid Ghidorah with Biollante and Batra arms? How about no? This is the stuff of nightmares. But things are gonna get even weirder. <sighs> Three. I love looking at vintage issues of TV magazine or similar publications. There's always some amazing art in here, some fun manga, and once in a while, you get articles like this one, with art of Godzilla chewing on Anguirus like a goddamn zombie. But that's not what I wanted to show you. Behold, Armored Godzilla. This is a Godzilla covered in mecha armor to fight space kaiju. He's got missile launchers, a rocket missile pod, Mazer beast killing laser ray cannon, I want it, I want it, I want it! The basis of this May 1984 article is that it's been nine years since Godzilla appeared on screen. How could he be powered up today? The side here is showing examples of ways Godzilla has powered up on film, like when he became magnetic or fucking flew. This art of various theoretical powered up Godzillas is from Hurricane Ryu, like Super Godzilla. No, not that one. This Super Godzilla is a combination of kaiju from past Godzilla movies. This guy includes Godzilla, Maguma, Baragon, Rodan, Gigan, Titanosaurus, Ghidorah, King Caesar, Kamakras, Gabara. Over here is a custom Godzilla, taking parts of past Godzillas to create one perfect version. Like the spines from Son of Godzilla, the head from Destroy All Monsters, the feet from the very first Gojira, and so on. In this November 1984 issue, we get a similar article theorizing on what the new super weapon Godzilla will fight in the upcoming film will be. Like, is it a cool X-Wing type spaceship? Or is it this awesome mecha? Nope. Once again, the magazine has showed us something cooler than what we got. I've seen these images make the rounds from some 2007 publication that features Gigan with machine gun arms. Here's another spread with machine gun Gigan. This one's labeled 2005. I really don't know anything about these, so if you do, hit me up in the comments. <laughs> do <laughs> You know, I thought the idea of King Godzilla was impressive, Super Godzilla was okay, but why not go further? Why not combine all monsters? Presenting the number one kaiju in the world. That's... That's about all it has here in terms of what do I refer to this abomination as. This 1967 art can be found in this book, Secrets of Subaraya Kaiju, and it's by prolific illustrator, Shuji Yanagi. All these Ultramans are getting their asses whooped, but look at these two specifically beating on the wings. 
Okay, so in here we've got Godzilla, Ghidorah, Mothra, Ibra, Zetan, Red King, Balton, Geronimon, Antlar, and just way more. In this August 1967 issue of Youth Magazine, you'll find this art by Shogo Endo. This monstrosity fuses King Ghidorah. That's Godzilla's head with Ultraman eyes, Kong's head with Daimajin's helmet, Ragon's fins, Red King's arms with Alien Bolton's hands, Rodan's wings, Kemular's backplates, Gamera's feet. You kill it. You see this thing? You kill it. Rounding out the trio of these kaiju centipedes is this 1967 art, also from Youth Magazine. Of all things, this creature uses Godzilla's back. It's also got parts from Gappa and Alien Bolton and... Man, they just really liked cutting and pasting monster parts back then, huh? Look at his face. Look at his face. One. This one's my favorite. And it's from a TV magazine, so technically it should have been part of number three, but whatever. So if you're watching this video, you're probably aware of King Ghidorah, Godzilla's most dangerous foe. And you're likely aware of Mecha King Ghidorah, a cyborg version. Or maybe Hyper Mecha King Ghidorah, Another cyborg, but this one's gotta be just like 10% organic at this point. My favorite is Mecha Ghidorah. This is an all Mecha King Ghidorah that first appeared in a TV magazine article in March of 1983. While not so much a story, this article sets up a fun imaginary scenario. What if evil alien races from across various Toho movies formed an alliance and then created a robot to destroy Godzilla once and for all? Yes! Destroy All Monsters 2! The ultimate Showa Toho Endgame! This group of conspirators would be known as the Dark Mysterious Star Alliance. Members included representatives of the Exilians, the Mysterians, the Black Hole Planet 3 aliens, the Keylocks, the M Space Hunter Nebula Roaches, the aliens from Battle in Outer Space, and even the aliens from the War in Space. And in this picture, there's even a glimpse of a Garuga alien from Zone Fighter. Look at this beast! Each of Mechagodora's heads can shoot a different type of ray. A heat ray, a freeze ray, and a gravity beam. This art of Mechagodora is by the legendary Yuji Kaida, one of my absolute favorite monster artists. And this piece here, with Mechagodora's head getting crunched by Godzilla, is by Masami Watanabe, another super toku artist. Whether you consider Mechagodora a variant or a completely original character, he's still one of my favorite obscure Godzilla foes, and a really fun matchup to think about. I think this is gonna be my final day. What? It's been really wonderful, but I think that my purpose in life is, is more than this. So, I'm gonna find out what it is. Where are you gonna go? I'm gonna go be a better person. Make, make a better life make others' lives better. No, clickbait, don't go! Clickbait, wait! Shit. I lost my YouTube rep. I lost my co-host. I lost my whole top five show. Oh, I guess this is it then. Goodbye. I'm just checking in on you. Did, did you save the world yet? Yep, I only shop at Whole Foods now. Isn't that awesome? That's... that's it? I'm so glad I can finally live with myself. CB, I've had time to think this past month, and... First of all, I'm so thankful for how you've helped me in my dumb gimmicky YouTube show. But also, I think I'm finally brave enough to tell you that... I love- Hold on, I might be. I have another call. Huh. Hmm. Oh my god! That was my agent! I was just cast to be in the new Dick Wolf spinoff Law and Order Minor Infraction Unit. Yay! Okay, I'm so excited. Bye! Huh. Well, that's one way to end a show.
Nah, I could do happier than that. Hold on, let me write a better ending. Hello? I love you too, MIB. CB! I love you so much! I love you more! I love you and I love you. I love you. I love you! I love you! Take care. Love, 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 love. I love you. I love you so, so much. I love you. Okay, don't forget my unpaid invoices, okay? I love you. Bye. Oh my god, the real top five show was the friends I made along the way.